Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I rise in opposition to um, House Bill 316. There's nothing more sacred to a democracy than the right to vote. It's what separates us from fascism. We are here, each of us, because we were sent here by the will of the voters in our district. Our decisions, the laws we pass, carry the weight of authority, but only when it's with the consent of the governed. And that consent is only given when the people have faith that an election was fair and fairly won. Our government's legitimacy and moral right to use state power is only justified and lawful when consented to by the people or society over which that power is exercised. When an election result is not believed, when people think results could have been tampered with, the people can lose faith in their government. And if they do, then the consent to be governed is withdrawn and we have failed the promise of the foundation of our country. I have, I have seen, as no doubt all of you have, the people's concern, our constituents' concern about our elections. I want them to know that I heard their voice. And I want to make sure that all of, all of you have heard it too. Some of you may think it's sour grapes or whining over the results of the last election. You may think some of the claims are specious. You might just think they're wrong. But I'm not up here opposing this legislation to fit anybody's narrative. I've done my own homework, and what I have learned is deeply troubling. So even if you think that the machines can't be hacked, that all votes are fairly counted, we still need the people of Georgia to believe in the process. And right now, they are unconvinced. And this bill somehow is supposed to make things better. But this bill is not very convincing either. This is a downright bad bill. There's some you know, line in the budget that says this bill will cost us $150 million. I don't believe that, and you shouldn't either. We have no fiscal note. We have no numbers. Of course, this morning, the, um, there were about 8 to 10 unredacted vendor proposals that the Secretary of State has had since August 2018 released. Um, why they weren't released earlier is a mystery to me. Why there's no fiscal note is a mystery to me, but it is um, v very curious in a troubling way. But of course, there's no time as of 9 a.m. this morning to analyze hundreds of pages of reports. Because there was no time for that, and we have no fiscal note, the best independent analysis we have is one that was released last week by the OSET Foundation, which stands for Open Source Election Technology Institute, and it was conducted by a veteran industry insider. And it puts the cost of the machines that we are mandating the state to buy at 90,000 more than handmarked paper ballots. Even more troubling, in addition to the failure to release the proposals and numbers, the Secretary of State's office has actually peddled false numbers. The Freedom Works letter that you have on your desks that decried this and said, the Secretary's analysis is like comparing the cost of buying a Chevrolet plus insurance, gas, and repairs for 10 years to the cost of buying a Bentley and then trying to insist that the Bentley is cheaper. And the letter continues, the Secretary of, that the Secretary of State would so gravely mislead the legislature on the cost of HB 316 is deeply troubling. And it calls this bill, these machines, a boondoggle for the vendors and an enormous waste of taxpayer dollars. Folks, this would be the biggest contract ever in the industry. It is one half the annual industry business total of 300 million annually, one half of it. Is there any surprise that the vendors are salivating over the notion of getting this contract? Is there any wonder that voters across the state and across the country are raising their eyebrows about what exactly is going on here. There's also the unfunded mandate, up to seven million a year. I've heard uh, about almost six million. I've heard one dollar per voter per, per year. We have no idea if that will fall to the counties or whether we will come up with it as a state legislature. The machines are not secure. 
the consensus of cybersecurity experts and computer scientists and our nation's premier National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine say, state that the best voting technology that's available is hand-marked paper ballots with a human-readable ballot marking device available for disabled voters. The National Academy of Sciences said, that unless a voter takes notes while voting, BMDs that print only selections with abbreviated names and descriptions of the contests are virtually unusable for verifying voter intent. The same study goes on to note that the difficulty and unlikelihood of voters verifying any BMD produced ballot has prompted calls for handmarked ballots whenever possible. So they're cheaper and safer and that's why 70% of the country is using them. Where these are used, they're typically only for the disabled voters, and of course, uh, that is appropriate. They are unauditable. We had a little bit of a discussion earlier about auditing, and there are uh, two big problems that I want to point out. The reason the studies, sh the reason folks say they are unauditable, and studies indicate that they are unauditable, is because there's been an interface between the voter intent and the actual ballot that serves as the vote of record. So it, when you hand mark a paper ballot, your intent is captured right on the vote of record. When you interface with a machine, the machine then has to record the voter intent. Unless the entire ballot is printed out and voters take notes, it is impossible to accurately verify the ballot. We all know that there are dozens of, you know, low, uh, unopposed judicial races. There are um, uh, constitutional amendments. Folks, we are kidding ourselves if we think that people can remember the entire ballot. We can't even do that. What a joke. Which means it is easy to have races added or subtracted through malware. It's just not hard to do. So therefore, and, and, and even if that weren't a problem, that voters, uh, that voters did have photographic memory and they would be able to accurately recall the ballot when they're, uh, the entire ballot that they just voted on the machine when they're staring at the piece of, of paper. Over half of voters aren't going to take the time to do it. And that is a problem because you know what, it's not their job. The voter's job is to vote. The voter's job is not to have to worry about the accuracy of the machine. And we, on this, put the onus on the voter to worry about the accuracy of the machine. And there's no reason for it. If there were a reason for it, maybe that would be acceptable, but there's just no reason to, to do it that way. It's already been mentioned how um, these, a, an additional flaw just came out, I believe Friday or um, Saturday, regarding these machines that were mandating the state to buy. There's an all-in-one function whereby even after the quote-unquote verification, the voter feeds the ballot back into the machine. Races can be added, the bar lines can be added to a barcode which invalidates the entire ballot and, and it would be unreadable and the voter would have absolutely no idea. Barcodes are another problem because if that, those are what's actually scanned and the voters will feel betrayed by that, then what they're even attempting to verify, they will understand that they can't verify it because they can't read it anyway. So I could go on and on, but there's like eight problems with this so-called um, you know, ability to audit. The audit language itself in this bill is extremely weak. It doesn't require any risk-limiting audits except for the pilot program, which is in one county. It doesn't require them after that. So all this talk about audits, not only can you not even do them with these machines, it doesn't, the bill doesn't even say we're gonna have them anyway. What a joke. The pre-certification audit isn't even a risk-limiting audit in this bill. It's a tabulation audit, and there is a difference. Shame on any of you who have not bothered to ask that question. When you dig into this legislation and you see all of the open questions, you just start scratching your head. Why on earth would we buy less secure machines that are opposed by the voters, opposed by national security experts, at risk of being decertified right now in New York, um, are far more expensive than 
the handmarked paper ballots are possibly going to be decertified by the by the national election authorities within two to four years when we're spending taking out a 20-year bond and you start saying why on earth would we buy these things i have been baffled absolutely baffled this is not a partisan issue you don't do voting machines on a party line vote this is crazy and so I'm like, what is going on here? I, I've, I've been given absolutely no good reason why we should, we should buy these things. There's not one good reason. So therefore, it just reeks of corruption that we're prioritizing vendors over voters. I want you folks to know that, that, that one of the individuals in the governor's office is still registered as a lobbyist for the top vendor that this bill appears to have been written for. His lobbyist credentials haven't even been terminated from that vendor. Come on, this is a joke. All voters oppose this, right wing, left wing. The only people that don't are the ones that want the contract to be as big as humanly possible. Well, I hope that we've exposed what is going on here. I think this, um, this bill is quite a debacle. I think that anyone that votes for it will have been derelict in their duty to the voters and taxpayers of Georgia. And I think it's gonna be a big problem from our state for years to come. And there is no reason to vote for it. And I'm shocked that it has gotten that far. And no one should vote for it without getting all these questions answered. We need the numbers from this morning analyzed. We need a fiscal note. We need to know what's going on with the New York machines. It is inexplicable why no one cares what the answers to those questions are. Just inexplicable. And therefore, you have the whiff of corruption. And it stains this, this body that we're passing it. Mr. Uh, President, I appreciate it. And I'm willing to answer questions if there are any. The chair recognizes the senator from the 27th. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, would you yield for a series of questions from your favorite freshman senator? Yes, I, yes, I would, Senator, of course. Thank you. Um, senator, you, I assume, believe in voter privacy, correct? I do, and that's another problem with this bill. Why would you support a system that inherently segregates able-bodied voters from disabled body or disabled voters? So, Senator, the largest risk of this system is that um, a computer hacking or malfunction could destroy the legitimacy of the election through the machines. There is, of course, a need for us to take care of disabled voters, and that's why most states do hand-marked paper ballots, and then they do have um, a, a machine more like this for the disabled. But it still makes all the sense in the world to have the most secure, best, and least expensive system for the vast majority of voters. But isn't it true, Senator, that if you segregate the voting process, that if a precinct were to have one or two or three disabled voters who had to vote on the machine that you're in favor of them voting on, and everybody else voted on a paper ballot, doesn't that eliminate their privacy when people can see how they voted in a recount process versus how the other folks voted in a recount process? It's actually fascinating that you asked that question. I wasn't even going to go into it, but there's yet another problem with at least two of these vendors, which is that all of the scanners encrypt a timestamp. So if anyone in a small county, in particular, it's the biggest risk, but any poll worker, whoever, that has access to the inside of the machine has written down the order that people voted, no one's vote is secret on these things because of the timestamp. And I've seen the user manuals referring to the timestamp. And that's another question that we have because if that is the case and, and those documents are accurate, which I believe they are, then none of our votes our secret on these machines, and that violates not only the bill, but also the Georgia Constitution. Thank you, Senator. I'll just restate my question, if you don't mind. Isn't it true that with your bifurcated proposal of different types of machines for different people, doesn't that inherently remove privacy for those who, because they have Alzheimer's or because they uh, may be not able to mark the paper ballot, doesn't that remove their privacy? Senator, my answer is these machines remove, have the high risk of removing the privacy for every single voter, disabled or not. Now, to Senator, answer your question, we do, of course, need to make sure that there is a way for the disabled to vote. But under your scenario, we're all in worse shape. If you don't mind, I'll continue with my series of questions. Sure, absolutely. Isn't it true what you're talking about, time stamping, also true of our current voting machines? 
I'm not, I've, I, I, I do not know the answer to that. Okay. Um, but there are a lot of problems with our current machines. I'm glad you mentioned that. Isn't it true that every member of your party who is still in this body voted for the current machines? I have no idea. That was like 20 years ago. It was, but I'll, if I may, that the senator knows of what he speaks. Um, oh, I have another okay. question about your, um, your unfunded, <laughs> you made a mention of unfunded mandates. Um, and isn't it true that if we go to paper ballots, you mentioned OSET earlier today, that their estimation was $95 million. The Secretary of State's estimation was $163 million. Isn't it true under whichever number you believe, if you meet halfway in the middle, call it, call it over $100 million. Isn't it true that that also is an unfunded mandate to the localities? The, the thing is, the Secretary of State's numbers, as I already mentioned from the Freedom Works letter, have been called out as being completely, as like peddling false numbers. So I don't really want to talk about theirs at all. Can you repeat okay, your question without referencing Sure, them? let's reference OSET's numbers, okay. which are um, $97,240,000. Uh, that's not the numbers I have, Senator. They had two sets of numbers. They had a okay. low number and a high number. That's their, that's their high number. Um, and I actually have a little bit of insight into this because my father's a ballot salesman in Illinois and has been selling paper ballots for a number of years. And so I ran some of the numbers by him. And he actually said that based on the pricing they do throughout Illinois, that the Secretary of State's numbers were pretty accurate. With one exception, he said probably 110% of the voting population needed to be printed versus 120. So I've actually, in my own analysis, discounted that. A little high, them. a little high then. But whether it's yeah. 90 million or you take their lower number, which I think was in the 60s, or you take 80 million, isn't that an unfunded mandate? So the numbers I'm looking at are just, are you talking about the differential between the um, handmarked paper ballots with moderate ballot printing and, uh, or high ballot printing. That's right, I'm talking all, about the 10 year, the yeah, on the, a 10 year, on a 10 year uh, life cycle of these machines. The, the, so the 90 million that you would get to between the moderate ballot and the uh, BMD? Just the ballot printing, just printing paper ballots. Forget the BMDs for a second. So I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. My question is, isn't ballot printing, which is expensive, between 40 cents and 65 oh, cents I, oh, okay. per voter, and as you know, we would need to print uh, ballots for every voter, even though we know every voter won't show up. Isn't that an unfunded mandate? Senator, you're preaching to the choir on that. I do think we need all these questions answered before we vote for this bill. Do you think that the reason, uh, since that is an unfunded mandate, do you think that's the reason why ACCG has supported this notion, is to avoid the unfunded mandate, let the state bear the bulk of the ver burden of the cost while not passing on the burden of that cost? to the localities, the counties, which is what would happen if we did have paper ballots? I don't want to speak for ACCG. I, I believe that their stance on this, which was developed a while ago, arose not from any, anything related to what you were just mentioning, but instead from the election supervisors. Thank you. And you mentioned earlier in your question, and you mentioned it again today, that this is, would probably be the largest contract, um, and that very well may be true. How many states, Senator, require a uniform voting process throughout all the counties in their states? The only ones I know of for sure are us and Delaware. I think that Oklahoma does as well, but it's okay. less than five states. So, Senator, isn't it true that by virtue of anything that we do, since we're mandating that it's uniform, and since we are using a single point of purchase via the, via the state, isn't it true that no matter what we do, we're going to be at the top tier of the expenditure because we will be the largest body making the largest purchase in a mandated situation, whereas 45 other states don't have a statewide mandate? Well, uh, two responses to that, Senator. Uh, the first is that it gets back to the exchange I was having with the Senator from the third, whereby it is not recommended that a state have an all-in-one system at every single precinct across the state because it doesn't leave you any room for error. So that's the first thing I would say is we shouldn't even be doing it this way. We should ha be able to have different systems so that we can have feedback and data to make sure we're utilizing the ones that work best. And then my second answer would be yes, of course our contract is gonna be large, but as the OSET report that we were just discussing points out, it is far larger using BMDs than using paper ballots. I, I will, I'll get, certainly give you that, Senator. Um, you mentioned the different machines. Can you sp help me understand more of what you would mean by different machines in different localities? There are, it, it is my understanding that um, because, as you so agreed, very few states 
do it this way where everyone uses a uniform system, every voter in the, in the state, it's done at the county level. And they recommend against everyone purchasing the same machines. It's done at the county level or at the city level. So that allows for different systems to be utilized. But are you referencing different types of ballot marking devices? Are you referencing different types of op optical scanners for paper ballots? What would you advocate for in, in that deployment? Well, what I'm advocating for currently, based on all available information, having received none that contradicts it in any real fashion, what I'm out advocating for is the handmarked paper ballots with optical scanners. I don't have, I'm not privy to any other conversations occurring across the country other than ours here, other than it is my understanding that 70% of people are voting on handmarked hand paper ballots. So that result would speak for itself to a certain extent. Okay. Um, you mentioned malware earlier as well, and you're a, a student of the law. I've um, owned a software development company for 14 years, so I'm a student of computers. Isn't yeah. it true, Senator, that any computer can be hacked? It is, Senator. And isn't it true, Senator, that the optical scanners that will require the vote, the counting of the vote, will require human programming? Yes. And isn't it true, Senator, therefore, that since they will require human programming, the optical scanners are also subject to malware attacks? Those, those also, as I was saying with the Senator from the Third, it's not that there's no risk, but as the National Academy of Sciences said in its recent report, while paper ballots also can be tampered with, the risk cannot be compared. An electronic system is vulnerable to a system-wide failure or cyber attack, while handmarked paper ballots would have to be tampered with one by one. The Senator, same report asserted that ballot summaries are impossible for voters to verify and says malware, suspicious software that includes worms, spyware, viruses, Trojan horses, and ransomware is perhaps the greatest threat to electronic voting. Thank you, Senator. This will be my last uh, question. And, and maybe what the folks left out of that statement, isn't it true that unless you have human counting, which I don't hear anybody advocating for, that under either system, the last stop in the voting process, whether it's a ballot marking device that prints the selection or it's a hand-marked paper ballot, the last step in the process is a computer that can be hacked. Isn't that true, Senator? That may be true, Senator, but what you're saying essentially is these machines have that, both have that problem. And what I'm saying is it is true that you don't eliminate all risk, but how can you make the argument that that these are equal or better when we also have eight other fantastic reasons that, that these are bad. Cost, they might be decertified, they are less secure because there, there's a computer interface at both sections. Cybersecurity experts are against them, voters are against them, the right and the left are against them. Like, th then there are like 14 other reasons for why these are bad. So they're just, I just don't get it. Maybe you can explain to me when I come back to my seat. I'd be happy to do that, and I would like to thank you for indulging your favorite freshman senator. I, I'm just so glad you've joined us. <laughs> do you continue to yield, Senator? Yes, Mr. President. I brought three protein bars with me today. That gets me nine hours. We can bring you some peanut M&Ms if you... Chair recognizes the senator from the 56th for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, will the senator yield? Of course. To my friend senator. from North Fulton. Senator, thank you. Uh, I appreciate your passion. Something you brought up that was concern, if you'll yield for a question, is you mentioned that anybody who would vote against this bill today would be derelict. Is that not true? You mean for it? For the bill, that's right. So in 2002, the General Assembly passed the current voting machines we have today. Is that not true? I do not know. Let's just say we'll that stipulate. I'm right. We'll stipulate. Okay. So, Senator, in 2002, your colleagues the senators from the 34th, the 36th, the 2nd, the 40th, the 26th, the 15th, and the 35th all voted for the current voting machines we have today that you have all went on and said there was a grave concern with non-audibility. So, Senator, were they derelict when they made their vote in 2002? Well, Senator, see, what's interesting is at the time, we weren't aware of all the concerns that have come to light now. None of those senators think that this system is a good idea, and this system is essentially the same system. It's really not any better. And I, don't, and I know none of them are planning to vote for it today. Will the senator yield? Of course. Senator, isn't it true that in 2002, 
the debate was very similar, and it talked about auditability. And isn't it true that right now the machines that are being offered actually have an auditability of putting the ballots in there and having a hand count copy? So the debate was similar. So isn't it true that if, if you are consistent with your message, then your colleagues that I just read off must have been derelict in 2002? I'll repeat my um, reference to the fact that we have far different concerns today than we did 20 years ago. Also, I'm not sure why we're talking about 20 years ago, but also I do want to mention, you may have missed my lengthy and astute uh, explanation about why these machines are not actually considered audible at all. I heard and, and so all. I won't repeat it, but let me just throw that out there again, that these are not actually auditable. Okay, last but not least, Senator, when uh, we're finally done with this debate and you go back to your desk, uh, are you going to do a hand marked ballot and carry it to the Secretary of Senate, or will you press your voting button and see it on the board? But, Senator, I'll be able to see how it comes up. Unfortunately, we can't do that with these machines. <laughs> the gallery will refrain. I'm happy to yield for more questions if there are any, but I'm certainly happy to take my seat, too, Mr. Chair President. recognizes the Senator from the 17th for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Yeo for a series of questions. Of course. Unlike our current system now, um, House Bill 316 actually calls for paper ballots, correct? Yes, the, there would be a ballot on thermal paper. Okay, and, and the bill also requires those ballots be human readable, correct? I think it does. It does not eliminate the barcode, which itself is a, a problem as we've discussed, but okay. it does, I believe, say human readable. The bill also says that the printout will say who the person voted for, which office they're running for, which political party they're a member of, correct? I believe so. And then a, in a summary format. Summary. Correct? And then yeah. The bill also says that once that printout is given to a voter, there'll be a sample ballot by the scanner where they can double verify their vote. Is that not correct? That is not correct. That's that was not amend in the bill. that was offered by the minority party and rejected. That amendment was actually no. accepted in the bill. No. And so I, I can go right to that we thought it was, or I thought it was. Um, unfortunately, that was rejected. We'll get some clarity on that. All right. And isn't it true that there's no, no part of this bill that keeps someone from still voting with a hand-marked ballot if they want to? That I'm not sure about. I do know that under current law, counties do have the ability to utilize a hand-marked paper ballot system, but this would actually take away that ability. And I don't know the answer to your other question. Can't any citizen still get an absentee ballot and vote oh, by hand? Oh, certainly, yes. And this bill does not keep that from happening, correct? As far as I know, no, it does not. And Senator, when we vote in this body, we push a button, correct? Yes. And after I push that button, I see my vote on the screen, right? Is that correct? Yes, yes. And I can also get a printout of that screen, correct? You can. Are you advocating this body go to hand mark paper voting as well? Well, Senator, as we just went over, I can see immediately if my vote was correct or not. I can also get the printout, which I could take with me, which would demonstrate whether the vote was correct or not if I was concerned. Um, none of that is true of these machines. That's correct, because with these machines, you automatically will see how you voted and will get a printout, correct? You don't keep the printout. That's right, because it's saved for the audit, correct? But the audit is meaningless. But the audit will actually be counted by hand. With the the audit, Senator, ballots, um, first of all, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, this doesn't, this audit language is very weak. It calls for, the only widespread audit is a tabulation audit, which is not the same as a risk limiting audit. Um, then there is a pilot program in one county on some kind of audit, but it doesn't specify anything past that. So no, I would agree that even if these machines were audited, the language in the bill is uh, regarding audits is not something any of us should feel confident in. My last question, do you believe that the Senate should go to hand mark ballot voting in this body? Um, if I had no idea how I voted and wasn't allowed to have a record of it, then my answer would be yes. Do you continue to yield? Yes, Mr. President. Chair recognizes the Senator from the 40th for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Senator yield? Yes, I will. I want to go back to the issue of hacking. Isn't it true that the voting servers at KSU were hacked? That is true. And isn't it true that there's no way to know if the DRE machines have been hacked? That's exactly right. And isn't it true that there was an anomaly in the 2018 lieutenant governor's race in which undervotes recorded on DR were recorded on the DREs, but not the absentee ballots, which are handmarked paper ballots? That is true. And that the chances of this happening 
by chance are near zero? That's exactly right. And you raise another really important point um, that we don't have any idea if these machines were ever hacked because there is no pa paper trail and we also can't look at the source code. The same problem exists with these machines. It's a private for-profit industry, a point I believe that the center from the 40th astutely made, which means that we are dedicating our public trust for our most sacred and foundational right to companies that will not let us test their, their machines for vulnerabilities. Um, I see my time has expired, Mr. President. Um, thank you, and I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Chair would like to recognize the Senator from the 34th.